This video is sponsored by War Thunder. More about them a little bit later. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for the president of MMORPGs and YouTube's baldest man, it's Idol! <laughs> My mug! Hello friends, we've got a great show for you tonight. We'll be talking about a um, re-release of a 20-year-old MMORPG. So, that's pretty cool. In 2013, after constant begging from a section of the player base, Jagex released Old School RuneScape servers, a version of everyone's favorite game, RuneScape, as it was back in 2007. Old School RuneScape would start off relatively small, even falling to as low as 3,000 concurrent players just six months after release. But over time, Jagex and the Old School RuneScape dev team would keep adding to Old School RuneScape, adding things as small as new quests or as large as new continents, and in between full of new raids and bosses and loot. All of these updates served to bring new life to this classic game, and now the player base is far outpacing even that of the main RuneScape version that it was originally spawned off from. The whole experiment of Old School RuneScape made two things abundantly clear. One was that there was a real desire for these classic MMORPGs, and that two, you could actually update and change these old MMORPGs to come up with something just as good, if not better. Old School RuneScape would be just the beginning of the re-release of old MMORPGs, the most popular of which would be World of Warcraft Classic, coming out in 2019. World of Warcraft Classic is a re-release of vanilla World of Warcraft, as it was in 2004. And World of Warcraft, deciding that copying half of Old School RuneScape's homework was a good idea, decided to release a new game mode called Season of Discovery, and for the first time, World of Warcraft Classic was getting new abilities, new raids, new loot. This is all done in a seasonal game mode, but nonetheless, it's been very, very popular, and it's had me thinking about the history of classic MMORPGs, what the changes to them mean, why they work, and if this is going to change something fundamentally about the future of MMORPGs. So let's go on a journey. Grab your National Treasure mug, which I'm sure you have. Everyone has one. It's a legal requirement. President Biden, pass it into law. And let's look back on the rise of classic MMORPGs and find out why modern ones just aren't hitting the same. Chapter 1. It's my MMO and I want it! <sighs> World of Warcraft has been around for 20 years at this point, and as with any MMO that's been around for a decent amount of time, it's received its fair share of unpopular updates. Changes that would have players yearning for how it was when they first started playing the game, you know, when it was at its best. That might be vanilla, for a lot of people that was Burning Crusade, for even more people it was Wrath of the Lich King, and for no one it was Cataclysm. Speaking of Cataclysm, that's when the first calls for legacy WoW servers really started gaining steam. Cataclysm was the expansion that had a dragon called Deathwing permanently burn down and obliterate many of the most important areas in the game, including heavily nostalgic areas like the human starting zone and more. You didn't have to do all that, Blizzard. That seems a little unnecessary. And with Cataclysm came a huge surge in private servers. Private servers are just privately hosted versions of an MMORPG where the developers can change whatever they want. Usually they'll change things like making the XP rates insanely high or having NPCs sell you endgame gear for free in like a starting zone, stuff like that. And private servers were a thing with every single MMORPG. I mean, I remember going onto YouTube in like 2007 and seeing people's insane RuneScape banks with like 40 party hats and then realizing, oh, nope, they're on a private server called Moparscape. Uh, it had this weird login screen with like a Lamborghini on it. it was, private servers were weird, man. But as World of Warcraft kept changing, the private servers were changing too. Not only were there more private servers popping up and more users on those private servers, but what they did was different too. Instead of being these insane cocaine rampage servers, they were actually just true representations of what the game used to be like. So you'd have Burning Crusade servers that really had no modifications at all. They would turn back time to how World of Warcraft was during that expansion and operate it kind of like Blizzard would. One of the titans of all private servers was one called Nostalrius. Nostalrius was one of these Blizzard-like servers, or Blizz-like for short. Again, that just means they have the integrity of how Blizzard operates their games. I don't know if this means that they have to follow the other Blizzard integrity rules, like, you know, abusing female employees, but who knows? 
It's hard to understate just how massive Nostalrius was. In its short run, it had over 800,000 accounts created, which for a private server is just wild. It also brought back vanilla in an extremely clean way. It felt like what vanilla actually felt like, and the dev team was extremely dedicated to keeping it that way. It also doesn't hurt that it came out during one of the darkest periods for World of Warcraft. It came out in 2015, one year after Warlords of Draenor came out. That expansion was butt. Honestly, I feel like IGN should hire me to do their game reviews. I'm so much more eloquent than they are. But in April of 2016, just over a year after the release of Nostalrius, Blizzard and its team of very expensive lawyers threatened to sue Nostalrius, and they were like, well, we're probably not gonna beat a bunch of billionaires in court, so uh, we're shutting down the server, guys, sorry. And the community was really responsive to this, understanding that Blizzard had a duty to protect its IP. Just kidding, the community had a goddamn meltdown. The shutdown of Nostalrius was covered by mainstream media outlets, and even massive non-MMORPG YouTubers were covering the shutdown, like JonTron, who made a whole rant about Blizzard following the shutdown. This is important because JonTron is a very intelligent gamer guy, and when he has something to say, we should listen. Wealthy, uh, they do. Wealthy blacks also commit more crime than poor whites. That's a fact. Wait, what? What? What did he say? All of this led to a petition being formed by the thousands of Nostalrius supporters to Blizzard saying, hey, just make official legacy servers, that way we pay you f for what we want. I mean, after all, it doesn't seem fair that they shut down all the legacy private servers without offering an alternative themselves, right? I mean, if I have to defend Blizzard, I mean, technically private servers are illegal and copyright infringement, but <laughs> this isn't about the law. If you want that, go watch Legal Eagle. But in my legal opinion, it's not very cash money to sue people. There's also the whole issue that after shutting down a bunch of private servers that were legacy versions of World of Warcraft, Blizzard kept trying to claim that people didn't actually want legacy versions of World of Warcraft. Have you ever thought about adding servers for previous expansions as they were then? No. And by the way, you don't want to, that, to do that either. You think you do, but you don't. You may have noticed that I use this clip a lot, and that's for one good reason. It's crazy. Oh, God, I should have gone into music. Eventually, after a ton of pressure from the community, the Blizzard team actually did invite the Nostalrius devs to Blizzard HQ to formally propose WoW Legacy servers to the World of Warcraft team. According to Nostalrius, after they flew out and made a whole presentation, they never heard from Blizzard again. So... Good job, Blizzard, bare minimum. All of this is to say that demand for World of Warcraft Classic goes back over a decade, and eventually Blizzard just couldn't ignore that demand anymore. So in 2019, they finally did it. But I stand, understand that for some of you, your favorite flavor is vanilla. Hey, aren't you that guy who said no one actually wanted vanilla? Hmm. Where'd my mug go? And why am I on a plane now? Hey, man. Hey, Tim. Excuse me, gentlemen. Do either of you know how to land a plane? Both our pilots are very sleepy, and we are going to crash. Yeah, I probably can. N no, you can't. No, I, no, he doesn't know how to fly a plane. Why would you say that? What? I've been playing so much War Thunder lately, I figure I'm probably able to figure out a real plane. What's War Thunder? Yeah, it's only the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. Plus, it's available now for free on PC and consoles. So what, you like fly planes in it? Planes aren't even the half of it. You can take command of over 2,500 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships of 10 major nations. Plus, the sound effects and intense combat are so immersive that you really feel like you're at the helm of the most powerful war machines of our time. That actually sounds pretty cool. Yeah, get in line, buddy. Over 70 million people play War Thunder and get in huge PvP battles all while discovering the other high quality content the game has. You can get the game for free on PC, PlayStation, and Xbox, and anyone can sign up using the link in the description or in the pinned comment. Plus, you'll get a massive bonus pack for new and returning players who haven't played for the last six months when you use that link, so you're gonna get some pretty cool stuff. Things like 100,000 Silver Lions, the exclusive vehicle decorator, the Eagle of Valor, and seven days of premium account access, so. Yeah, pretty good stuff. Wait if you want, but the bonus pack is only available for a limited time. All right, all right, Tim, I'll download it now. Wait, isn't this plane crash? 
Oh, thank God, it was just a dream. Oh, oh what was I talking about? Uh, right, World of Warcraft Classic. Blizzard finally released World of Warcraft Classic in 2019, and it was such a massive event. The queues to log into World of Warcraft Classic servers were as long as 0.0009% of a full year, or the amount of time it takes Jeff Bezos to make $12 million. That's insane! That's so long! Blizzard rolled out WoW Classic in phases, like it was done back in 2004, with each phase unlocking some new content until eventually all of the raid tiers were released, culminating in Naxxramas, the final raid of vanilla World of Warcraft. After that, WoW Classic vanilla was complete, and Blizzard had uh, no idea what to do next, I guess. But despite the fact that vanilla was basically being completely ignored, it remained Pretty damn popular for the next four years, maintaining a healthy player base, a passionate player base even. And Blizzard knew they couldn't just sit there and do nothing. They had to expand. Oh no! Chapter two, Luigi's expansion. Like, <clears throat> Luigi's mansion, cause this, it's spooky and this is also spooky. <clears throat> As you can see, I did make a uh, little PowerPoint presentation for this, uh, for this part. My name's Idol. Oh, if it looks like I'm wearing different clothes than I was just before, no, I'm not. You're misremembering. You always do that. You're always so forgetful. Y your friends are always lying to you. I'm the only one who tells you the truth. You should only trust me. <laughs> With the blank canvas that was World of Warcraft Classic, players started to dream of something more. World of Warcraft Classic, but with new things added, like quests, bosses, dungeons, raids, really anything. They were thinking of something not unlike what old school RuneScape was with its constant update system. And it was working really well for old school RuneScape. I mean, it hit its all time peak in players in 2023, 10 years after it was initially released. This dream version of World of Warcraft Classic was called World of Warcraft Classic Plus. Jonathan, I am begging you to stop writing that comment where you're saying something like, Ooh, but if you make updates to an old MMORPG, won't it just turn into the new version that everyone hated in the first place? Jonathan, you're an ignorant piece of garbage and no one loves you. There's a reason I started this video with the example of Old School RuneScape, and that's because back in 2013, when Old School servers were first getting proposed, I was heavily involved in the RuneScape community. I mean heavily involved. On one of my old YouTube channels, I uploaded this trailer called Two Jagex from the RuneScape community, and it was supposed to help convince Jagex to release old school servers for some reason. That's weird, but like a bunch of other people uploaded it, and I guess it worked. So good job past me. I should make it clear, I didn't make the trailer. I, I was one of the people who re-uploaded it. I wasn't talented enough to make good videos. And when old school servers were being polled to even exist, I remember being on the forums fighting with people, telling them that old school servers would totally work and that they wouldn't just die in two months. But as much as I hate Jonathan, his argument's an understandable one, I guess. I mean, the same company that ruined the MMO in the first place is the one that would be updating to and changing the old version, so. What's to stop them from ruining it? I think the problem with this argument is it fundamentally ignores one key part about human beings, and that's their ability to, you know, learn. For example, there's no way that a 2007 version of RuneScape would get the evolution of combat, the most unpopular update in RuneScape history that was the whole reason people started begging for classic servers in the first place. People are smart enough to learn that that was not a good thing to do. So it's silly to think that even a company as bad as Blizzard would do something as dumb as just like re-releasing all the expansions, including Cataclysm 2 Classic, thinking that's what people wanted. Anyway, uh, Blizzard released the Burning Crusade Classic uh, just a couple years after World of Warcraft Classic was released. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, that's understandable. Burning Crusade Classic was really popular. And I think we can all forgive that. Uh, I mean, it'd just be weird if they kept doing it, like releasing Wrath of the Lich King Classic in 2022. Um, that would be weird. That would be strange to do. But hey, you know what? Again, that was a super popular expansion. It was even like the peak player count for World of Warcraft. So, you know, whatever. It's understandable. But I think we can all agree that Wrath of the Lich King Classic is where it's going to stop. Blizzard, no. Blizzard, don't! We're happy to announce Cataclysm is coming! <laughs>
Why? 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 Yeah. This is as good a time as any to hammer home just how bad of a company Blizzard really is. I think we should probably start with the fact that, first of all, it took them years to even admit that people wanted Classic in the first place. Yeah, I already used this video clip, but it's so relevant that it makes me angry. Trust me, I am far from a the customer is always right kind of guy, but when the customers have proven to you via private servers that they want this, it's so dumb to ignore it. Stop being dumb. And then the decision to just lazily re-release expansions to Classic is borderline predatory because Blizzard knows better than anyone that any new expansion to an MMO is going to get a surge in players and make some short-term profit for them. And ultimately, that's all Blizzard cares about. Short-term profit more than long-term games or health for their games. I think the sad part is that Classic Plus has so much potential and is such a natural fit because World of Warcraft Vanilla when it first came out was an extremely ambitious project. And for as big as it was, it was supposed to be even bigger. I mean, you can tell this just by searching World of Warcraft cut content on YouTube and finding literally hours of videos of things that got removed from the base game. Or if you don't wanna to create totally new content, you're free to take content from the existing expansions and revamp them to be more classic. This is something that Old School RuneScape does all the time. For as much original content as there is in Old School RuneScape, so much of it is either directly ported over from or a modified version of stuff from RuneScape 3. And that's fine. There's good stuff even in bad games. This is how it should work. But again, Blizzard is just so much more focused on short-term profitability that the idea of investing real development time into something like Classic Plus seems to be genuinely sickening to them. That's why they even decided in 2022 to release the WoW token to Wrath of the Lich King Classic. In case you don't know, the WoW token is basically just a legal way to trade real life money for in-game gold, allowing you to buy best in slot gear and to level up even faster than you already can. The addition of a microtransaction to a classic MMO is so insane because if you ask any MMO player who's played for the past 10-ish years what they liked more about old MMOs, one of the first things they'll say is the lack of microtransactions. Before they say anything about game design, it's just the fact that there were no microtransactions and Blizzard just couldn't help themselves. But to be fair, this is and was Blizzard's vibe. And I think the former CEO of Activision Blizzard, Bobby Kotick, put it best when in an interview in 2004, he said, I just don't wanna pay taxes. <laughs> This is a real quote that I found in The New Yorker when he was at a Republican fundraising event to get Bush reelected and the interviewer asked him about his political views and he's like, I play both sides. For example, I'm pro-life and I like stem cell research, but I like to donate to Republicans because I don't want to be taxed. <laughs> What a psychopath. I guess I will cut Blizzard some slack here though, because Old School RuneScape also introduced a microtransaction in the form of bonds, which is basically the exact same thing. Real life money for in-game gold. The difference being that the Old School RuneScape dev team for the last 10 years has spent time building up goodwill with their player base by delivering high quality updates. Whereas the Blizzard teams have spent decades, you know, abusing their employees. It's kind of different. So where does all of this leave WoW Classic Vanilla? in a really good place because of a player-made hardcore add-on. A couple of years ago, a team of talented developers and passionate World of Warcraft players made the hardcore add-on. Usually add-ons and plugins just do small helpful things like notifying you when your hit points are low or telling you there's a rare mob spawn nearby. But the hardcore classic add-on was massive. It was a fully fleshed game mode. Obviously like all hardcore game modes, it made death permanent as much as it could. The Hardcore Classic add-on became so massively popular that it brought a second life to World of Warcraft Classic Vanilla. And even in each region, entire servers were co-opted to be hardcore servers unofficially. These servers were usually the role-playing servers, so a lot of role players got mad that that happened, and to them, I'm sorry, as a token of my appreciation to you, I will now say, it got to the point that even Blizzard couldn't ignore the demand for a hardcore game mode. So finally, for the first time in Vanilla's history, Blizzard added something to WoW Classic. They added the official hardcore game mode. Official hardcore servers were really popular and a lot of fun to play on. I played on them for a very long time. They weren't exactly perfect, like they didn't have achievements, they didn't have a solo self-found mode, but 
it was something and it brought back that sense of community and it's always fun to get an official game mode. But with the World of Warcraft Classic dev team finally showing that they were alive and capable of creating content, the dreams of Classic Plus were reignited once again. I mean, if the dev team can make hardcore Classic, maybe they can make some new content, you know? Maybe it's kind of different, but it could be the same. And as these hopes were reaching a fever pitch, it was time for BlizzCon 2023. BlizzCon is when Blizzard makes announcements about all their major games, World of Warcraft included. And people started thinking, this might be it. This might be the time they announced Classic Plus. And so Blizzard got on stage to tell us what was next for World of Warcraft Classic, and then they announced it. Season of Discovery is Vanilla WoW with a spicy twist. Listen to how happy they are. They love it. Chapter three, Season of Discovery, what I did to your mom last night. So the announcement wasn't received particularly positively at first, but there's a pretty good reason for that. With all the hype that was around WoW Classic because of hardcore and all the hopes and dreams of a Classic Plus, anything less was always going to be a disappointment. And then there's the way Blizzard was building up the announcement of Season of Discovery to make it sound as much like Classic Plus as they could. All that culminating in a seasonal game mode is just... Yeah, it's just kind of disappointing, man. Especially when you consider that WoW Classic already had a seasonal game mode. But what? I said that hardcore was the first thing they added. Well, I lied. It was a storytelling device and you fell right into my trap, you fool. <laughs> Back in 2021, Blizzard did release Season of Mastery for WoW Classic, another seasonal game mode that lasted 12 months, but honestly, was nothing more than fresh start servers. Yes, there were boosted XP raids, some encounters were made a bit more difficult, but it didn't have nearly the amount of hype or anticipation that Hardcore or Season of Discovery would end up having. Plus, some of the changes to Season of Mastery were just kind of controversial. Like, it had some quality of life changes, including the looking for group tool that is one of the most controversial changes in WoW history. Yes, it adds convenience, but at the sacrifice of social interaction that people really liked Classic 4 in the first place. So the promise of another seasonal game mode just really didn't spark much hope for WoW players, understandably. But when the devs started to go into what Season of Discovery actually was, the excitement started coming back. They talked about their key goals with Season of Discovery, and one thing that stuck out to me is that they were really, really good goals to have when designing a fun MMORPG. These goals revolved around things like making sure social interaction was an important part of Season of Discovery by sharing secrets with one another to find out where hidden things are. And those hidden things would be in underutilized areas of the game to encourage you to explore the map like you hadn't had to since you were a kid. It felt like the primary objective was to bring the adventure back to the game, which is such a great goal to have because I feel like some people forget that MMORPGs are games and they should be fun! This was all really exciting to the people in the crowd because it has been a long time since an MMO has had a true sense of adventure. I mean, just listen to how hyped they got when they announced there wouldn't be a public beta for Season of Discovery. In order to preserve this sense of discovery, we will not be holding a public beta or PTR for Season of Discovery. Thank you, yeah. But nothing got people more excited than when Blizzard said that they would consider adding completely new experiences at Endgame for Season of Discovery. We are leaving the door open to the possibility of completely new experiences and the prospects of exploring previously unfinished or unused locales for future raid and dungeon content. Oh, sorry, getting a level 60. I know, I'm excited too, I'm excited too. That sounds a lot like it could be Classic Plus to me. I mean, I'm not sure he could have been more non-committal when he was saying all that, but hey, it's more than we've gotten in the past, so we'll take it. So just a month later in November of 2023, Season of Discovery came out and it was awesome. Season of Discovery is a temporary game mode, just like Season of Mastery was, but on a whole nother level. Throughout the world are runes, which are things that give you new abilities and passives to each class that fundamentally change or improve how they operate. These runes could do things like making Warlocks, traditionally a damage dealing class, very viable tanks so they can absorb a lot of damage. They can make melee hunters viable, if not overpowered, and hunters are traditionally a class that likes to do damage at a distance. And most impressively, they made druids good. 
Druids suck! In addition to runes, Season of Discovery also added things in like new PvP overworld events, new and modified loot, some additional quest lines to enjoy. But by far the biggest change from Season of Discovery comes from phases. Season of Discovery is released in multiple phases with each phase having a level cap, starting with phase 1 that has a level cap of 25. In each phase, one of the dungeons from around the world is converted into a raid that is basically endgame content for that phase. For those who are unaware of the difference between dungeons and raids, dungeons are instanced content just like raids are, but they're usually pretty easy to get through and a lot shorter, requiring only 5 people to work together to get through it. Raids, on the other hand, can have as many as 10, 20, or even 40 people and requires good team composition and a lot of teamwork. So in converting a dungeon to a raid for each phase, Blizzard could have just been like, oh look, we added more hit points to each of the boss monsters. But no, they actually thought through it, added some new interesting mechanics, and while they're not the hardest things in the world, they're much harder than their dungeon counterpart, and it's the first sign that Blizzard is actually capable of adding to and modifying WoW Classic, which is just, it's fun, man. It's really fun. And of course, each raid comes with tons of new best-in-slot loot, not just modified versions of existing loot. It's really just a good time. The phase release schedule and the level banding from the phases is so great because it not only allows people who don't have a ton of time to dedicate to World of Warcraft time to get to max level and grind out best in slot gear, but it does give an advantage to the people who do want to put a lot of hours in because they'll make a lot of money by being able to grind out all of these dungeons and raids first before anyone else. Another advantage is that Season of Discovery has made so many changes to each class that if you want to try out a different class, you have plenty of time to get to max level on your main character and then even get a few other characters to max if that's what you want to do. It really just encourages exploring the game again. It feels brand new despite it being built on this decades old infrastructure. Season of Discovery so far is far from perfect, but it doesn't need to be perfect, it just needs to be fun. And it's definitely fun. I feel like I've said it's definitely fun like a million times, I'm sorry. I would like to tell you that Season of Discovery's population is booming, but unfortunately Blizzard hasn't released subscription numbers since 2015. They said it's because subscription numbers are just not that great of an indicator of business success, which I'm sure had nothing to do with the fact that in 2015 we were just one year removed from Warlords of Draenor. <laughs> I'm sure it was completely unrelated. But anecdotally, I can tell you that all the servers are constantly at high capacity, and when I'm just running around doing quests or doing raids, there are tons of people. The chat is always active. There's always people ready to group up to take care of some more difficult quests with you. It just, it feels alive, and that's all you can really ask for. So I guess the only question to ask is, why? Why is this update to an old MMO one of the most memorable experiences for millions of MMORPG veterans out there? And why is it so often the case that modern MMOs don't give that same feeling? I think it might be tempting to say it's all about hype, but new hyped MMOs and new hyped expansions come out all the time and usually find a fraction of the success. I mean, most WoW expansions do get a huge surge of players on release, but a couple months later it dies down considerably. Or look at RuneScape 3, which in August of 2023 had the necromancy skill come out, and by all accounts, that was really well received. It even caused the peak player count to be as high as it's been since early 2022, but just two months later, the player count dipped to as low as it's been since 2019. Hype doesn't last. Okay, but maybe it's not hype. Maybe it's nostalgia. I think nostalgia might have something to do with it, but when you consider the fact that it's the changes to the old MMOs that are making them popular again, that just feels like it can't be nostalgia. It feels like it goes fundamentally against that. Full disclosure, I have made a video about why old MMOs were better before, but I didn't talk about in that video why making changes to those old MMOs worked so well. I'm gonna do that now. Chapter three, the modern classic. Fuck, it's chapter four. Ah. To figure out why modern MMOs struggle, but old MMOs with changes can succeed, it's important to look at what actually changed in the history of those modern MMOs to make them start to struggle. What actually put them in the place where players were begging for legacy versions? For RuneScape, the answer is fairly obvious, and I've actually already mentioned it in this video. It was the massive ground-up rework, the evolution of combat. 
The simple combat system that had been in place relatively unchanged since 2001 was now just completely removed and replaced with this action-based hotbar system. I'm not gonna try and sit here and tell you that the RuneScape combat was the most interesting in the world, but it worked really well for what RuneScape was. It was kind of the soul of the game in a lot of ways. The way the game was designed fundamentally was just never going to work for a World of Warcraft style combat system. There's also the whole issue that RuneScape operates on something called ticks, which are 0.6 second increments that inputs are processed on. So that means if you're spamming abilities and trying to get through your ability rotation, the 0.6 second delay can just make it feel clunky and like it's unresponsive. Ostensibly, the evolution of combat was supposed to allow Jagex to make harder and more interesting combat encounters, and like that's probably true, but RuneScape already had scary boss encounters as it was. Just remember Jad. I mean, it wasn't actually that hard, we were just 8 years old, but still, it was tough at the time. And there's the fact that the old school RuneScape team has made plenty of really genuinely challenging combats using the same combat system with almost no changes. That's because the old school team didn't try to change the design of the combat system, they designed the encounters around the combat system. They prioritized gear switching and prayer switching as mechanics that players had to get used to and be able to react to quickly enough. This all makes modern bosses feel classic, which is all they're going for. So for RuneScape, it's easy to see what went wrong. They took a fundamental core part of the game and replaced it. It's hard for any MMO to survive that. The same thing happened with Star Wars Galaxies with the new game experience. It also doesn't help when you throw a bunch of microtransactions into the game at the same time that you make a huge controversial content update. So yeah, it was just kind of like a shit sandwich. I think World of Warcraft's change over time is much more interesting, and there's a lot you could pinpoint as the reason that the game started to struggle, but there's one thing that I really focus on when I look back on it. First, let's do a quick refresher. We all know what this acronym stands for, right? Very good. MMORPG stands for Massively Multiplayer Online Role-Playing Game. Now let's focus on this part. Role-playing game. The RPG aspect of MMORPGs is almost as, if not just as important as the MMO part. I mean, go back to the release of World of Warcraft back in 2004 and a lot of the people who hopped on early were veterans of the RPG genre, or a lot of them were players of the TTRPG genre, like Dungeons and Dragons. That's because World of Warcraft was a true RPG, it just also was an MMO. I just want to make sure that it's clear that when I say RPG, like role-playing game, game, I don't mean like me role-playing in Dungeons and Dragons as my schizophrenic kobold character Flinty, I, I mean like the genre of games, like Mass Effect. And the RPG genre is highlighted by customizability. A lot of the customizability comes from character creation, where you can change how your character looks, but even more of it comes from the decisions you can make about how your character does things. In World of Warcraft Classic, there's two main ways you decide how your character does things. The most important is obviously the class, that will change basically everything about your playstyle, but the second most important comes from the talents. Classes in World of Warcraft have remained mostly the same over the course of two decades, sure there's been rebalances and additions of new classes, but the core system is pretty much as it was. But the talent system is one of the most brutalized things I've ever seen in my life. Here's how the talent system works in Classic. Starting at level 10, you get access to things called talent points. Every level starting at 10 will give you one talent point that you can invest into these talent trees. Every class has three talent trees, representing the three specializations. The more points you invest into a talent tree, the deeper into that talent tree you can go, but you're free to spend your talent points in whatever specialization you want at whatever levels you want. This can sound overwhelming, I mean, there are a lot of options here, but really, it's just one decision you have to make at every level. It's more of a slow burn. And if you discover that deeper in a talent tree you're not getting the kind of build you want, you can always pay a fee to respec so you can reuse all of your talent points and do whatever you want with them. I really like this system because it does encourage you to go deep into one specialization with the most powerful parts of each talent tree being buried at the lowest tiers of each of them. But there's nothing stopping you from making a true hybrid build where you can just dip quickly into another talent tree before going hard on your 
your specialization or evenly distributing your points if that's what you want to do. According to the Warcraft wiki, by the time Wrath of the Lich King came out due to the level cap increases, there were 71 talent points you'd be able to invest when you hit max level. There were some classes where there were over 230 talents you could invest in, which yes, is a lot, but I love having that level of choice in how my character plays. And of course, as with any RPG, meta builds did start floating to the top, but there were tons of viable, less optimal builds you could go with. It was your choice to make. But Blizzard decided that the talent system was getting a bit overcomplicated and they wanted to streamline it. I've made a lot of jokes about the fact that Cataclysm was the end of classic for a lot of players, and I usually like to keep my jokes based on the surface level destruction of the world that it brought, but the truth is, Cataclysm had a lot of changes that were also... cataclysmic. <laughs> Starting in Cataclysm, players could no longer invest talent points in whatever talent trees they want to. Instead, they had to pick a specialization, and they had to go all the way through that specialization tree before they could invest the remaining points wherever they wanted. This was also coupled with the removal of a lot of talents. You now only had 41 talent points, despite the level cap still being as high as it was in Wrath of the Lich King. Again, I understand the desire to streamline the talent system because it was going to get more and more complex the higher the level cap went, but I'm just never a fan of reducing the player's agency and making their choices for their character. And forcing specializations and then cutting the talent points almost in half is its just an insane combo to me. It's just wild. This desire to streamline only went further in the next expansion, Mists of Pandaria, where the talent trees were gone. They're gone. They're gone now. They removed them. In Mists of Pandaria, you still picked a specialization, and that would give you access to some of the former abilities that were locked in the talent trees. But now, instead of picking a new talent every level, you would pick one of three talents every five levels. This was called the tier system. It sucks. The amount of choices you make is just so dramatically reduced with this system, it's, it's just so bad. And the fact that you don't get to look forward to every level up the way you used to be able to, and now you have to wait every five levels to just pick between three options, it's just so bad, man. It's just so bad. And also, your specialization didn't change the three talents available at each tier. Those were the same no matter what your specialization was. That's, that's ridiculous. Your specialization, if you're gonna make me pick it, should still have an influence on my talents, I feel like. In a matter of just two expansions, what was once the second most important part of your character's build was relegated to kind of an afterthought, and as expansions continued coming out, the tier system would remain, with just some minor changes here and there. Talents became much less important, frankly, to your character's build, and I just think it's a shame. It really started to lose the RPG feel of it all. And I think this is reflected well in the quality of the expansions that came out during this time. Of those four expansions, I would say only one of them was good in Legion. The other three were Warlords of Draenor, Battle for Azeroth, and Shadowlands. Yuck. And Blizzard, I think, started to realize this. Maybe that was helped by the fact that players were begging for the old talent system, but hey, what do players know? In 2022, with the Dragonflight expansion, talent trees finally made their return. This wasn't done the same way as talent trees used to be done, but it was pretty damn close and it was an interesting reimagining. In Dragonflight, you still pick your specialization and that would determine which talent tree you're investing points into. But alongside your specialization tree, each class had a class talent tree. And I mean, just look at these talent trees. They're deep and complex and they branch in a ton of different directions. There's so many decisions to make and so many builds you can go with. And the fact that you get to make two decisions per level is just, it's so cool. It really feels like it just looks like an RPG, am I right? Like it just, ah, it's good, good. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, you probably saw that video where I do a really weird impromptu impersonation of an Italian. Um, I would like to deeply apologize. That was uncalled for. And, um, oh man, I understand if you don't want to support me anymore. Ultimately, I still think the loss of hybrid builds is a shame, but replacing it with a deep, complex, and rich talent tree system is just something I'm always going to be a fan of. I think this change is a key reason that Dragonflight is considered by many to be the best WoW expansion in years, but obviously it goes down to more than just talent trees. Dragonflight did a lot to bring back the RPG feeling to World of Warcraft. 
There's really an emphasis on making a beautiful world that is interesting to explore, adding cool quest lines that make you feel immersed in the world. It just feels more like an RPG. But unfortunately, there's more to making a good RPG than what was brought back in Dragonflight. And one of the big things for me is the leveling experience. The journey of leveling in an RPG, not just MMORPGs, is so important because again, you're supposed to feel like you are the character you're playing and seeing your character grow and improve is hugely, hugely important. The leveling experience in MMORPGs is extremely hard to nail. You wanna make sure it's paced correctly. It has a lot of variety and that you get good power-ups as you level up without becoming overpowered. I think WoW Classic is an example of an MMORPG that nailed leveling. It can take a long time to get to max level in WoW, but it feels rewarding at every step of the way and you explore the whole world of Azeroth going through all these different biomes and environments and fighting different monsters that it never really feels all that grindy. The modern expansions of World of Warcraft have done nothing short of shitting all over that. Leveling in Modern WoW is a trivially fast part of the game. I mean, there's a reason there are glitchless speedruns that go from level 10 to max level in Dragonflight in under five hours. That is wild. Or, you know, the fact that you can literally buy a level boost, real life money, to get to the maximum level. They have made leveling an optional part of the game. When to me, it's such a key integral part of the game. MMOs are more than whatever fancy endgame you came up with. They're about the grind to an extent. And yeah, that grind has to be fun, but it's a part of the journey. It's a part of what keeps people playing and makes them feel accomplished. Okay, so let's go back to why new content in old MMOs is working now that we know what wasn't working in modern MMOs. First, as I've already said, it's the ability for devs to learn. They can use what they've seen in the two decades of changes to the modern versions of whatever MMORPGs that are working on to inform the decisions they make today. Again, old school RuneScape would never have the evolution of combat introduced. They've already seen that that doesn't work. Instead, you design around the existing system and you use, I don't know, creativity to make cool things that don't take away the soul of the game. And they've done that to great success. And Season of Discovery is the same kind of thing. You take abilities from future expansions and bring them into Classic while still making it all feel like Classic. You add new mechanics to raid encounters, some that might even be inspired by raids from future expansions, and you just make them feel like Classic. You scale it up to the difficulty that your players can handle today without fundamentally changing anything about your core systems. The foundations of these old MMOs are great, and they're capable of being added to and built on top of without completely gutting. And what happens with a lot of the updated versions of these MMOs, like RuneScape 3 and World of Warcraft Retail, is they change the foundation. That's not the part that needs to be changed. Build on top. Don't re-foundation it. Stop that, get away from there. So what about new modern MMOs? Things like New World or Ashes of Creation. These are games that don't have a time-tested foundation to build on. It's not like old school RuneScape building on top of the 2007 version of RuneScape. They're starting from scratch. These MMOs are more than capable of using the research they have from classic MMOs. It's just often, it's too risky to do that. MMO devs these days need to prioritize one thing, and that's short-term profitability. That means getting players hooked right away as quickly as possible. Usually that comes in the form of microtransactions to speed up the leveling process, or just having fast leveling in general to get people to their fancy endgame as quick as possible. <clears throat> Creating long leveling grinds that really cause your players to have to invest a lot of time before they get to your end game can be really risky because again, making leveling good is hard. And let's be honest, people are likely to quit MMOs in the first two hours of playing it as it is. So usually new MMOs will just not even try to make leveling an investment and make it feel like an RPG. They'll just try and make it more like an action RPG like Diablo, where the point is to hack and slash a bunch, and then you're just hacking and slashing harder things. It's really kind of soulless. I hate to keep harping on New World, but I do think it's a good example of an MMO that almost got things right and then just didn't. In my video, I praised the leveling grind, but then I also said it got really boring really fast. And New World is a game with already fast leveling. I mean, you level very, very quickly in that game. 
but they just didn't add a good amount of variety to the leveling grind. It didn't feel like I was making progress. It just kind of felt like I was doing the same thing over and over and over again. And yeah, making leveling good is hard, but if people who truly love MMORPGs and RPGs in general are working on them, I think they're more than capable of capturing that magic that OSRS and WoW Classic have captured. I mean, it's not like they have some time-gated secret behind them. Yeah, they have a leg up because of their name, but the systems are more than capable of being copied and adapted to fit whatever new MMO is coming out. And I think one day we will see that. <sighs> I'm gonna go curl up in a ball and cry, I think. Chapter five. Holy crap, this video is too long. I said a lot of words in this video, especially in that last section, but this is just something I'm really passionate about. And I think people get very doom and gloom about MMORPGs these days, thinking that that magic is not capable of being recaptured in any other version than just the old MMOs. But the truth is, I think we're just waiting for the right team to take a stab at this genre again to really figure it out. A team that ideally would be independent of some massive publisher. Like, look at Larian Studios, which is an independent game studio, and what they did with Baldur's Gate 3. That, by all accounts, is an extremely, extremely ambitious and risky game to make. But because the devs there are passionate and don't have to worry about EA's deadlines or microtransaction models, they could make the game they wanted to play, and it turned out beautiful. And I have hope that one day that will happen for the MMO genre. Um, that's cope, though. That's copium. I am coping, and uh, boy, oh boy. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching this far. Um, if you've made it to this point, why don't you leave a comment that says, Damn, Idol, this was really good to edge to. <laughs> Thank you again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to play it for free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox now by using the link in the pinned comment or video description. Hey, you're a patron. Thank you so much for your support. Hey, you're a patron. I like you very much. Cause hey, you're a patron. Patreon is where you're at. You went to the URL in the description and you gave me your money and that's pretty neat. Hey. Thank you so much for your support. Hey, you're a patron. I like you very much. Cause hey, you're a patron. Patreon is where you're at. You went to the URL in the description and you gave me your money and that's pretty